Okay, um, so welcome to the cell modeling tutorial. Um, I'm joined by a, a community member um, from Hungary who uh, doesn't have a microphone or a camera currently on, but um, is sending me chat messages that I can read. Um, but if you're watching the stream, you probably can cannot see. So um, I will um, be reporting out what the interactions are um, as, uh, as I see them. And I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but it looks like Istvan um, is, our, is our guest. And we're expecting one other uh, to join us as we go. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started since we're uh, already 10 minutes in and, um, and see how this goes. So um, I'm going to start the conversation um, with um, something that we talked about in the live stream just now in the open house um, with a um, demo with uh, point pointing us to uh, some badges that you can uh, earn as you're learning about uh, this stuff and I'll kind of use the badges as a way to walk through um, the main topic so um, first a bit of history um, so when we're talking about modeling cells, um, there's actually many different ways that one can go about doing it. And there's many different features of cells that you can go about simulating. So um, uh, currently in the um, field of computational biology and cell simulation, um, a vast majority of work that's done is looking at pieces and parts of cells, like aspects of cells. So um, you almost always simplify the cell down into um, some sub part or some sub feature of what it does biologically. You almost never simulate the entire thing. Um, one of the exceptions to this is some work done by uh, Jonathan Carr and colleagues um, in a journal club that we, we highlighted um, this paper that they wrote back in 2012, 2013, um, which is called, um, so it's a whole cell model. Um, this was one of the few cases where they took a cell and tried to throw everything under the sun into this model. So um, give me one second and I will pull up the, um, pull up the slide actually on this. So the approach, um, of this paper um, in terms of cell modeling was to be holistic. A word that means, right, like having a comprehensive um, view of what a cell does and really trying to make sure that you weren't leaving any details out about um, what that cell's doing. Um, so this is um, obviously a lot harder than just picking one small piece of a cell and trying to model it, but um, the reason that uh, folks do it is that um, then the model that comes out is much closer to experiment. So uh, you can actually measure the things in the model and they can be directly related back to things that are that you can measure. Um, so let me show you here. Um, okay, so this, uh, for example, is um, some of the key figures from this uh, paper. So it's Cardall 2012. And um, on the left, um, this is like a cartoon that shows um, all the different biological features that were modeled. And um, in particular, um, so things like DNA replication, chromosome segregation, um, the transfer of uh, the transformation of DNA or the transcription of DNA into RNA, the translation of RNA into proteins. Um, proteins getting modified, proteins getting folded, proteins getting processed, pro proteins getting moved, ribosomes getting put together, metabolism happening, things coming from the external environment and feeding into this process. Um, and uh, polymerization. And then the main thing that this model did um, is sort of shown here in this uh, movie. So basically when the simulation started, we had one cell and then as the simulation progressed, essentially the process that, that the cell was doing is it was undergoing cell growth and eventually cell division. Um, so as all these different uh, biological processes are going on, um, uh, there's uh, energy that's getting consumed, uh, there's translation that's happening, 
Um, and then there's a variety of different, um, you know, uh, values or concentrations of things that are changing dynamically as you go through the simulation. So you can see this up at uh, covertlab.stanford.edu. Um, this is really excellent work. Um, but this is not stuff that uh, Openworm has, uh, has really done. But, um, but that's that stuff. So, um, okay. So the reason I show that is because holistic modeling is what we're aiming for in C. elegans. But um, in, the only reason they were able to do this particular cell as holistically as they did is because um, mycoplasma genitalium, which is the organism they modeled, is very, very, very simple. It has the, uh, one of the fewest number of genes of any organism that they found, and they've done a lot of um, data processing on it. It's only a prokaryote, which means that its cell biology is also simpler. So there were a lot of reasons why um, uh, that's done. So far, there isn't a, a model of any eukaryotic cell uh, yet that's that detailed and comprehensive of any cell anywhere, right? Which is striking because like we're all made up of cells and so on the planet there's like trillions of trillions of cells, right? But we don't have any computer models of you, any eukaryotic cells at all that are good at all. So when we come to C. elegans, it has 959 cells. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to get to the holistic modeling that this, that this did for um, prokaryotic cells. Um, uh, just because there's, there's nothing. But we can, what we can start to do is we can start to take steps to collect the data that are required to get there. And we can focus on some aspects of cell activity that um, we do have more data on and some of those features. So um, uh, I guess it's worth saying that like, so how did they simulate any of those uh, processes? So what's really going on? So when you see these little ribbons here, uh, these little uh, lines that are connecting these different uh, nodes, essentially. This is basically like a network graph, but underlying those little, you know, nicely carved lines with different colors um, is uh, a system of equations. So basically, um, they're taking uh, differential equations that define how one thing uh, transforms into another, um, very much like you have equations of motion in physics that will define how a ball will move through the air, how a projectile will, um, you know, how like a cannonball will fly through the air and hit a target. Um, it's a similar uh, system, um, sort of equations of motion define how things move through the world. So um, the kind of math that you need to understand to really um, be able to get into this is sort of um, differential equations. And that's where we're gonna start um, our, uh, our exploration here because what we're gonna be looking at is a specific system of differential equations that um, is used for neuronal modeling, for modeling of neurons. And um, we're gonna look at um, the work of understanding how that cell membrane, uh, how the dynamics of the cell membrane influence how neurons communicate with each other. Okay, um, the, this rests on some important science from a couple of researchers um, in the mid, in the 1950s, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. Um, so a little bit about Hodgkin and Huxley and what they did. Um, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so, um, so basically Hodgkin and Huxley but that's that stuff. So, um, okay. So the reason I show that is because holistic modeling is what we're aiming for in C. elegans. But um, in, the only reason they were able to do this particular cell as holistically as they did is because um, mycoplasma genitalium, which is the organism they modeled, is very, very, very simple. It has the... Uh, one of the fewest number of genes of any organism that they found, and they've done a lot of um, data processing on it. It's only a prokaryote, which means that its cell biology is also simpler. So there were a lot of reasons why um, uh, that's done. So far, there isn't a, a model of any eukaryotic cell 
uh, yet that's that detailed and comprehensive of any cell anywhere, right? Which is striking because like we're all made up of cells and so on the planet there's like trillions of trillions of cells, right? But we don't have any computer models of you, any eukaryotic cells at all that are good at all. So when we come to C. elegans that has 959 cells, obviously we're not gonna be able to get to the holistic modeling that this, that this did for um, prokaryotic cells. Um, uh, just because there's, there's nothing. But we can, what we can start to do is we can start to take steps to collect the data that are required to get there. And we can focus on some aspects of cell activity that um, we do have more data on and some of those features. So um, uh, I guess it's worth saying that like, so how did they simulate any of those uh, processes? So what's really going on? So when you see these little ribbons here, uh, these little uh, lines that are connecting these different uh, nodes, essentially. This is basically like a network graph, but underlying those little, you know, nicely carved lines with different colors um, is uh, a system of equations. So basically, um, they're taking uh, differential equations that define how one thing uh, transforms into another, um, very much like you have equations of motion in physics that will define how a ball will move through the air, how a projectile will, um, you know, how like a cannonball will fly through the air and hit a target. Um, it's a similar uh, system, um, sort of equations of motion define how things move through the world. So um, the kind of math that you need to understand to really um, be able to get into this is sort of um, differential equations. And that's where we're gonna start um, our, uh, our exploration here because what we're going to be looking at is a specific system of differential equations that um, is used for neuronal modeling, for modeling of neurons. And um, we're going to look at um, the work of understanding how that cell membrane, uh, how the dynamics of the cell membrane influence how neurons communicate with each other. Okay. Um, the, this rests on some important science from a couple of researchers um, in the mid, in the 1950s, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. Um, so a little bit about Hodgkin and Huxley and what they did. Um, so uh, let's see here, charges to move, um, right? Um, that's something that the cell tends to exploit. Um, the fact that there's a, an imbalance of charge from the inside and the outside is one of the things that allows it to, to carry out um, many of its biological processes. So a cell is also like an electrical device in a certain way. Um, and the proteins um, that make up the, these, transynaptic, uh, these transynaptic proteins are responsible for it. Different families of those proteins um, allow different kinds of charge to pass through them. And that's where Hodgkin and Huxley kind of picked up. So um, what, what they discovered and um, sort of were working with um, in order to make their discovery was that there were specific ion channels that um, create currents through the membrane potential, uh, excuse me, through the membrane. Um, and they defined these things, these, these things as equations. Don't worry, I'm sort of zooming up and down here. Don't worry about following this at the moment. Um, I'm sort of scanning the page to find stuff that uh, I want to pull out here. But um, so there are essentially, uh, there's sodium, channels, so there's ion channels that allow for sodium to pass through them, there's ion channels that allow for potassium to pass through them, and then there's what was called leak uh, current. So sodium ion channel, let's see what we get. So if you look up a sodium ion channel, what you'll find is that um, it's, a, it's basically a kind of membrane protein that allows sodium ions, so Na plus from chemistry, um, so you know, this, we're basically talking about single atoms that have charge um, that move through a plasma membrane. And um, often um, there's a key thing about these sodium channels, which is that they're based on, they're voltage gated or voltage sensitive. So they actually um, modulate how open or closed they are based on the difference of charge across the membrane. So if there's a big difference of charge across the membrane, they might open. If, they're, if there's a small difference of charge, they might close. Um, not all ion channels are voltage gated or voltage sensitive like that. Um, so some ion channels, it doesn't matter whether 
the um, you know what the memory potential is at the time or what the voltage is at the time. Memory potential and voltage, by the way, are synonyms. That's a it's can be a source of confusion. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so that's one type of sodium channel. So basically, Hodgkin and Huxley um, identified that uh, the neurons that they were studying had these sodium channels. And they also identified that they had uh, potassium ion channels. Let's see. <clears throat> um, and so potassium channels are the most widely distributed type of ion channel, and they're found in virtually all living organisms. Mm -hmm. And so if a sodium ion channel allows only sodium to pass through it, can you guess what a potassium channel does? It allows only potassium to pass through it, right. Um, and so um, that's basically the idea. It's a pore through the membrane that allows only one kind of ion to pass through it. Um, and this is a ball and stick diagram of what a uh, potassium channel looks like, including in purple, um, the potassium ions actually moving through it and all the rest of the stuff it makes up the, the channel. This is as if we're looking at it um, from the bottom to the top. So like we're like peering down the pore. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. And uh, this is also a, you know, a cool thing. There's a whole area of uh, cell biology that just tries to figure out the structure of these ion channels and understand from a chemical perspective how they work. In this ball and stick model, obviously the balls are individual atoms um, and, and they, uh, they're attached together with bonds to form, a, to form a molecule. So, okay. So that's the sodium channel and the potassium channel. So Hodgkin and Huxley um, put those two together as well as a, a leak channel. And they, and they um, from the perspective of the, um, uh, from the perspective of this uh, circuit diagram, basically, they're able to translate that into a system of equations that I'm gonna walk you through. Okay, now, um, oh, cool. And there's Richard. Okay, great. Um, so we've got folks, two folks in the, in the room. Richard, are you there? Let's see. Include, I'm bringing you into the broadcast, but I see that you're muted. Okay, I'll continue on. Um, feel free to uh, unmute and uh, throw in any questions there. Oh, there. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, yep. Hello. Hello, I'm here. Great. Good. To, good to see you. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm not quite sure when you popped in. I think in the last ten minutes or oh, so. The, the two minutes. <laughs> two minutes ago. Okay. I'm. Um, I've been walking through um, some of the basics of um, cell modeling, starting with um, partial cell modeling, holistic cell modeling, and uh, now I'm going into um, the membrane of the cell, ion channels, and I'm uh, going into the Hodgkin-Huxley equations now. Oh, okay, great. Okay. 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 Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So Istvan is asking uh, in the chat here. Um, familiar with single neuron models? I'm curious whether there is whether one is able to model C. elegans neurons with tonic potentials, including the dynamics of synaptic neurotransmitter release. Cool. And then I understand that without the voltage gated sodium channels, neurons won't produce action potentials, and the membrane potential is tonic. But I don't understand how this regulates neurotransmitter release. Is it analogous? Okay, so that's a so that's an advanced that's a good advanced question. Um, let me get to the synapse. I think what you're basically asking is about yeah the synapse and uh, and its uh, and neurotransmitter. Okay, great. So that so we'll have a place for that. Um, and uh, okay, so I will try to get through some of the the math and relatively quickly if you're already familiar with. Um, some single neuron models. Um, um, so, okay. So, just to say here, real quick, that um, as a si an aside comment, that yes, um, there are many different ways to model neurons, and some of the most popular um, are some of the simplest. Um, so, I think modeling neurons and neural networks is a topic that started in artificial intelligence. Um, in a, in a subsection of artificial intelligence that at the time was known as connectionism. And at that point, um, neurons were um, really 
didn't have any dynamics of their own. They're really just units that will take in a um, basically either like a plus or a minus, and then if they have enough pluses, they send a plus downward and they can be connected together. Um, if they have minuses, they may not add up to enough. If you have combinations of pluses and minuses, you may not reach a critical threshold to send a plus forward. Um, and um, so this is a very, very simple model that doesn't really even involve time. Um, one of the catchphrases for this was called a perceptron network. Um, that was defined um, in order, yeah, in, in, in this sort of sense. And so this was taking a key feature of neurons that they have a, um, a connection that they connect other units together. Okay. Um, so from a single from a single neuron perspective, this is very simple. Um, real neurons, um, uh, you know, have been studied by recording their membrane potentials over time. And, and in order to study them, we literally put a glass pipette through that membrane that I was just uh, showing, and we record the value of the membrane as it, uh, the value of the difference of charge across the membrane over time. So a very simple model there is something called an integrate and fire model. And um, integrate and fire models are also useful, and we use them in the project. Um, but they're also uh, simple um, and kind of too simplistic for the purposes of, um, what we're doing in OpenWorm for a few reasons. Um, the key one being that um, when you get into C. elegans neurons, some of the dynamics uh, of C. elegans neurons are not captured by integrate and fire neurons. So, uh, so let me just share here real quick um, just a little bit of a comparison. Um, so if you go to the bio biological neuron model Wikipedia page, um, uh, you can see that there's this integrate and fire model, which is also described using a similar kind of math from what we see in the Hodgkin Huxley model. And um, it basically um, will just uh, say that when you get over a certain threshold of membrane, you're going to have a feature which is to create what's known as a spike. And the spike is a very popular feature. In fact, a lot of energy in neuroscience is devoted to the spike or the action potential. It's essentially an all or none electrical feature that a neuron exhibits um, where it very rapidly goes um, between its uh, minimal and its maximal uh, voltage and then comes back down to a refractory period and then levels off. Um, a lot of neurons in m mammal in mammals do this. Um, but it turns out that uh, in worms, as far as we've seen so far, um, they don't. So consequently, an integrate and fire model where you've got action potentials is not good, <laughs> not good enough. Um, it's only a way to do some very rudimentary tests, uh, like sanity checking your, your model. So consequently, we go down one level to hodgkin huxley model, and that's why we're using that, um, because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually require, even though it was used to describe the action potential, you can actually change the weights of the of some of the values and you can get different um, different dynamics. Um, so you can very perfectly well represent a cell that doesn't have any action potentials at all using exactly the same math and just some different, essentially. Um, and in fact, this has been done um, and there are many papers that describe that. So I kind of basically focus you on that. Feel free to read ahead um, on the Biological Neural Neuron Model Wikipedia page for other ways of modeling neurons. Some of them are simpler, like Fitzhugh Nagomo as well. Uh, Morris Lacar, these are often used for doing um, analyses that can look at a whole lot of neurons at the same time and try to figure out kind of what their aggregate activity is. Um, but uh, for the moment, uh, we won't go into those. Okay, so I said we were going to look at badges um, a while back. And I want to um, go ahead and point you guys at um, the following. So over the course of the project, um, we've We've taught cell modeling many times, <laughs> and um, uh, every time we do it, we try to leave behind uh, some materials um, to make it easier for the next uh, folks to um, to learn it. And in fact, um, a couple years back, uh, some of our community members decided they were going to put together a tutorial to explain how Hodgkin Huxley worked. And so this is um, completely community generated, um, and um, basically starts to walk folks through the details of the math of the Hodgkin-Huxley tutorial. 
Um, so you can, uh, so if you want to be following along, by the way, um, feel free to start with this badge, basically, and go ahead and check it out. Um, and um, so I um, will just say briefly um, how this tutorial works and just some features of it, and then explain um, uh, you know what you'll need to do in order to earn earn the badge if you're so interested. I think it's a nice way to kind of summarize uh, the learning that you'll get out of this uh, going through this tutorial. So the tutorial basically starts off with an explanation of what it is and what's going on, provides you with a table of contents. Um, uh, even though the first thing is the impl is an implementation, I'd actually recommend starting first with um, the biological electronic equivalents, which is the second section. So it's going to walk you through um, some of these things. So you can see here we pulled the this diagram again out of Wikipedia, and um, it basically starts to break down what these different features are in order for you to understand how um, equations are going to be put back together. So we can first have to understand the components before we can really see how they are fit together. Um, so um, the membrane capacitance is going to be described, um, the lipid bilayer current, and so you're going to basically get a description that includes the mathematics as well as um, how it gets it gets pulled together into a, a larger system of equations. And then you're going to see um, from those equations what they look like when you plot them. Um, and so in this case, just you know, very briefly, this top plot is the membrane potential. So again, the changing in charge across the inside and the outside of the, um, uh, of the membrane um, is what's graphed here in, a, in, in, a, in this case in a simulation. Then uh, currents. So um, I, N, A, I, K, and I, L, these are the three kinds of, essentially, ju you're just checking to see the, the current that goes through specific ion channel types. So N, A, of course, is sodium, K is potassium, and L, in this case, is leak. And so the yellow, cyan, and magenta lines here are showing you how the current changes um, and this is, uh, you know, synchronized together. So when the action potential goes up, you see that potassium uh, has a positive current uh, through it. The potassium channels have a, a positive current, and you see that um, you get the sodium channels having a large negative current going through them, um, and that's in lockstep with the peaks of these action potentials. Again, this is a simple model of Hodgkin Huxley, so you do see action potentials, but um, even in Seligan's neurons, um, you can still see the same features of of these dynamics with or without um, ion, uh, action potentials. The spiking part is independent of the fact that the system of equations can be used. Okay, and then um, what you'll see um, here, um, I'll encourage you to read more about this, but basically the ion channels are made up of uh, other variables that are underneath those, which um, are related to basically the opening and the closing of channels, as well as the inactivation of channels. So you'll learn more about that. And the bottom graph is showing you that um, Input current that is put into the system, so that you can um, uh, so that you can see the spiking happening only when you're exciting the cell. So it's as if you've stuck in more current um, yourself uh, for this period of time, and then you've turned it off, and then you've stuck in a whole lot more, and you turned it off. And what you should note is that um, here the X potentials go. Um, there's a fewer of them than there are over here um, when you've got more current, and this is a well-known feature of neurons as well is that when they're more highly stimulated, the rate of firing uh, should go up. And that's all, this is all going to be described here in text, but I'm just giving you a sense of what that looks like. Okay, so I'd say start with this, um, and then um, you're going to get um, a little bit on the implementation. And um, it's going to point you at um, how to run these simulations yourself. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So what you'll be able to see is um, the various components of um, things like the membrane capacitance that are described in the equations. You'll be able to see them described in two different ways. So this page basically acts as a Rosetta Stone, if you will, between math, between a Python version of this simulation and between something else which is called a NeuroML version of this simulation. Um, probably don't have time to go into the NeuroML version, but um, I do just want to highlight the, the Python part. So um, what I'd suggest doing, if you're interested in this part of the cell modeling, is to have a look at HodgkinHuxley.py 
um, if you want, you can literally just copy and paste this code here. It's a, it's, it's a, a single, uh, it's, it's self-contained other than the fact that you have to grab um, a SciPy installation. Um, but other than that, uh, you can basically just run the script and you'll get out the plots that are shown um, in the other, uh, you'll get out the plots that are shown in those, uh, in the figures that I showed you earlier. Um, and as you walk through the code, as I encourage you to do, um, you'll start to get a sense of how it's put together, um, how the different systems of equations are defined um, from the math um, in, um, you know, in, in lines like this, which define um, the gating kinetics of a given channel, or um, I think one of the main lines. Let's see, this one is going to be the input current, and another one. Yeah, and so a lot of action is happening down here um, when you're pulling together the different uh, values of the current. So. This is the sodium current, this is the potassium current, and the weak current. Okay. Um, so if you go ahead and go through this tutorial, um, you'll be, um, you, you're able to join this badge, and you'll be asked to put in some evidence, which will show that you're, um, yeah, which will show that you have, uh, have run through it. So there are exercises uh, that are at the end. And the exercises are going to ask you to do a few things, uh, change some scripts, and to show the results of those, um, the results of these things. And for the badge, just go ahead and um, you know provide the answers here, and then uh, take a screenshot of the plot for 1.6 and submit that as well. And um, if you do that, you will have earned this badge, and you'll demonstrate that you know something about Hodgkin Huxley dynamics. Um, which is, uh, again, the dynamics that underlie one component of neurons that we're uh, simulating, which is their, their changing memory potential over time. Um, okay, so goal, so that's a sort of abstract description of math. Um, let me now go to the matter of uh, synapses that uh, Isfan was asking about. Um, and let me just introduce the synapse real quick, because um, it's, a, it's a key um, neuroscience topic. <clears throat> okay, um, so the way that um, that uh, all neurons transmit uh, information between each other when we're talking about the real biology, um, and, and these are not C. elegans neurons, by the way, they, they'll look somewhat different than this, but um, we'll just use this as a cartoon anyway because it's going to have the key features. So it's, it's both an electrical and a chemical system. Um, the electrical part we just talked about is about how the membrane potential changes. But um, neurons have a specialized um, part, which is known as the axon. And that axon is, we commonly think of it as an output, um, although the truth in biology is that sometimes axons can be both inputs and outputs. Um, and in the worm, this, uh, this can be true as well. But we'll leave that aside for right now. The simple, um, think of it for the moment, is just an output. So what happens is that as uh, membrane potential of uh, the cell is changing, um, as it rises, um, it's likely to increase the membrane potential all along the axon. And as the membrane potential is rising, it's essentially, you can think of it as propagating the membrane potential, or if it's an action potential, it's um, propagating the action potential. Um, so you think about a little spike that's moving down here. And then it's going to hit the end of the, um, the end of the axon. And something very special happens at the end of the axon which is that um, you have the release of neurotransmitter molecules. And what this is showing in this picture is that there's basically the, you know, the, this, this axon comes right up to another cell, okay, and it forms what's known as a synapse. And so there's one end of the synapse which is called the presynaptic end, and the other end is called the postsynaptic end. Pre because it's before, and post because it's after. And so it's a one-way transmission. And what happens is that literally the cell will open up and it will allow a special chemical that it has uh, built up at the very end of the axon to spew outside of that cell to flow across what's known as a synaptic cleft or a synaptic gap. And then those neurotransmitters are going to be fitting into receptors that are on the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, the, the membrane of the, of the partner cell. Um, those little receptors are going to act like little keys and little locks of those receptors. And then those receptors are going to, in turn, um, change the membrane potential of that uh, neuron. 
and therefore uh, transforming the, uh, this chemical signal into another electrical signal um, for itself, okay? Um, so even though there, so whether there is or isn't an action potential, some, some, some synapses basically will only do this if there is an action potential, but other synapses can be sensitive to uh, the change of action potential, um, excuse me, the change of neurotransmitter. Some cells can be sensitive to the change of, um, uh, to the change of a membrane potential um, without a sharp spike. Um, so while what I just showed you was that like, let's say there's a spike, it's coming down here, it sort of hits as a discrete event, and then suddenly um, neurotransmitters spews across the synapse, um, what can happen is that, um, and what does often happen, is that actually the picture is a bit more complicated. Um, there can be a neurotransmitter continually flowing across the synaptic cleft, and that neurotransmitter um, essentially uh, the level of it that is uh, flowing across will change the amount that the cell that it's uh, connected to is um, excited or not. So um, just to kind of cartoon this, if you can imagine that there was only a single molecule of neurotransmitter that flowed across this cleft every, you know, every, you know, time period, let's say once a second, that's uh, actually completely unrealistic, but let's say if there was only one of these a second, then the opportunity for the partner cell to change its memory potential would be very low, and consequently this would be relatively unaffected. Whereas if we were at hundreds of these a second, then there would be lots of chance for this uh, neurotransmitter to affect the um, postsynaptic cell, and so the effect would be large. Um, so um, basically as the member, so what regulates whether it's one a second or hundreds of a second um, can depend on the current level of membrane potential of the presynaptic cell. Um, so that is what's kind of thought of as like analog processing. So um, actually the C. elegans cells seem to be sensitive to just how much neurotransmitter is flowing across at a given time, and it goes up if the partner cell is, has a higher membrane potential, it goes down if it's, uh, if, if it's a lower membrane potential. So um, uh, I hope that that's answering Isfan's question. Just read it one more time. Without voltage-gated sodium channels, neurons won't produce action potentials, and the memory potential is tonic. Uh, but I don't fully understand how that regulates neurotransmitter release. Is it analogous? So then to put a fine point on the um, question, so it's not so much the memory potential is tonic. Tonic is a, another word for it stays the same always. Um, the memory potential does change. Um, it just doesn't change with dramatic action potentials. It changes more smoothly um, over time. So I think that's what answers that one. Um, okay. <clears throat> so um, now that um, I've explained you a little bit about that, I want to move to the to getting a little bit more specific. Um, let me see if this, okay. So we talked about the Hodgkin-Huxley um, tutorial, and um, we built another tutorial um, in our batch list that um, is level two. So after you've earned your Hodgkin Huxley tutorial badge, I encourage you to try for um, the Muscle Model Explorer badge. Okay. And so the Muscle Model Explorer badge um, will actually take you into open worm code. Um, a prerequisite for the Explorer is the Muscle Model Builder. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one. Um, other than to say that the steps are all about loading the code for the muscle model onto your system. Now, um, let me say a bit about what the muscle model is. Um, we've um, uh, inherited um, code from a collaborator in the project who has built a model of um, the muscle, the ele electrical aspects of the muscle of the C. elegans, and has done it in using the math of um, Hodgkin and Huxley. Um, it's available on GitHub here, and um, basically um, this is gonna show you that the dynamics of the muscle cell that we're looking to reproduce involves basically putting an electrode in uh, to a muscle cell, which the muscle cell has the same uh, kind of system. It's got a membrane, it has ion channels that go through that membrane, and therefore it has dynamics. 
And um, uh, if you put a electrode through it and you run it through an amplifier, you can um, do experiments where by sending different um, amounts of uh, current through the cell, you can measure over time its change in voltage, um, or you could do the opposite, which is change the voltage and um, see how that changes the current as it flows through the cell. So these are the kinds of experiments that you use if you're trying to not just uh, re you know, reproduce the math in general, um, but you're actually trying to get to actual biological cell activity. Um, and so because there's uh, this paper that was already there and it did a very nice job of getting at uh, this level of detailed dynamics for a C. elegant cell, um, instead of starting by modeling a neuron, um, we actually used exactly the same math, exactly the same tools, and exactly the same techniques that we would for the neuron, but we actually began um, describing the muscle cell. Because for our model, the muscle cell is also a critical component that we know what its dynamics are, because um, the, the change in the electrical activity of the muscle cell directly goes to the force that the muscle cell is going to put on either end, which is ultimately going to contract, which is ultimately going to move the body of the worm, which is going to give us the ability to simulate the, the worm. Um, so, um, that's so, okay, so this um, repository at github.com slash openworm slash muscle model is, um, should be, in addition to some open source libraries, should be everything that you need to be able to play with this and experiment with it. And so the muscle model builder is basically going to give you instructions um, for how to do that. Um, how to use GitHub uh, to get that, to grab that stuff, to snapshot it to your machine's directory, and to work with it. Um, I should also say, if you are a novice um, when it comes to uh, GitHub, if GitHub uh, is something that you're not familiar with, if you're not, there's a badge for you. There's also a GitHub best practices uh, expert badge. And this will start you even earlier in the process of learning how to use GitHub and what it is and how to get um, basically uh, started um, you know, making some changes using GitHub. So um, if uh, GitHub is still new to you, I recommend checking that out. And there's a lot of good resources on the web too that will teach you pretty quickly. Um, but, um, but you should do that. Okay. So at the end of the Muscle Model Builder badge, you'll be able to grab the code, install the code, and run the code. And um, you'll submit to us screenshots that uh, show you that you've actually been able to run it, which is quite cool. Okay, and so now the Muscle Model Explorer badge. So you'll have to earn the builder to get to the Explorer. When you get to the Explorer, um, it'll ask you to prove that you've done the prereqs, and um, it'll ask you to basically run some code that generates specific figures from the paper that we drew the simulation from. And um, what I'd like to do is show you a little bit about what that's gonna look like. Um, actually, I'm going to need to share a different screen, so bear with me for a second. As I do that, I see that there's some more questions that have come through, um, so let me pause uh, then as well to address those. Uh, um, so, uh, Isfan asks, is there anything known about this membrane potential NT release function, linear or exponential? or is it too specific to synapses to have a general model? Um, so there is a paper that we are, um, uh, is our next thing to integrate into, um, into this. So there, is, so there is data that's on this, but there's not yet a really good um, computational model that is fully, is fully well-tuned. Um, but this is some of the work that we're doing with the muscle model. So um, this gets into a bit more of an advanced topic, but let me just sort of carve it out so that you understand. Um, so there have been some studies in C. elegans where um, they've put motor neurons, which are the neurons that directly synapse onto a muscle. So the neurons that are one synapse away from the muscle, that synapse directly onto it, that form a direct connection. Um, they put them under optogenetic control, which if whether uh, you seem like you know a bit about neuroscience, but for those of you who don't, um, it essentially allows you to use light at the right frequency to take a neuron and turn it on. Okay, so we're using light to stimulate a neuron. So they've done these studies in C. elegans where they were able to stimulate the neurons that are connected to a muscle. 
And so, um, and some of them are uh, put a excitatory neurotransmitter on the muscle, and some of them put an inhibitory neurotransmitter on the muscle, um, which means that some of them increase the activity of the muscle and some decrease the activity of the muscle. And they're using um, a synapse, which is one of these uh, these synapses that are always releasing as well and you, that you can read. Um, and we have some GitHub issues that are built into this muscle model um, repository as we're trying to make it better. Basically getting a more detailed and a better synaptic model is one of the things that we're uh, wanting to do. So um, this paper is one of the keys to doing that because they basically have data recording from the muscle and from the neurons as they're doing these different st stimulations. And so they're basically able to, you, know, you can work out um, the effect that the synapse is having because they're controlling the input and they're getting, they're reading the output. Um, and they're also showing studies of just stimulating the muscle without the um, neurons, which is also necessary. So um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, it, you know, it, I, if it's a linear function exactly. Um, it's probably not entirely linear, but it's probably also not exactly exponential. It's probably somewhere in between. Um, but um, maybe some sort of a sigmoid function. Um, but um, what I can say is that like we're kind of working on that in the project. Um, and um, although right now we, we, have, we have really what's more of a placeholder of a synapse model, um, which we know is like just approximation, but, um, but we'd love to have more help for folks to come in and look at this particular paper and help us model the synapse in greater detail than we can right now. So, um, so it's not too specific to synapses to have a general model. There are many models of um, synapses that, uh, that can be used. Um, and in this case, it's a matter of finding the exact one that's uh, you know, appropriate for this particular uh, animal. Okay, um, so Richard asks, um, <laughs> yeah, long answer. Um, uh, okay, so Richard asks, um, does OpenWorm allow for feedback from muscle cells to neuron response parameters? Uh, feedback from muscle cells to neuron response parameters. <clears throat> well, um, so currently, um, I believe that um, there is no... It's actually a really good question um, about the b biology of this. So I don't, I'll say I don't know, um, but um, I, I could probably dig more deeply to understand this because it's probably important. But um, I believe that all of the connections from neurons, between neurons and muscles that have been described in the connectome are only chemical synapses. And chemical synapses are the one-way connections. So, so that means that information can only flow at least through the synapse, directly from the neuron to the muscle and not back. There's a second kind of key connection though, known as a gap junction or an electrical connection, which neurons have with each other and which mus muscles definitely also have with each other. And I am not aware of a gap junction connection between a muscle and a neuron. If there were any, connections like that, then you would have direct feedback. You would allow for feedback from muscle cells to neuron um, response. Uh, yes, and I'll, yes, so I'll get that. yes. Okay, so if there, so first gap junction. So if there were gap junctions, then you would, you would have a direct electrical connection back um, into those. Um, I don't think they're, they're appear in the connectome, but um, I need to double and triple check that. I would, it would be it would be interesting for us. What we've what we've done in the project is we've taken the connectome, which is like thousands and thousands and thousands of connections, which have been labored over by hand to accumulate into a spreadsheet, and then we've we generate our network from that. And so there's there are actually questions like this that can be mysterious until you go and you like write a little script to actually ask that question. Um, and I just don't think we've written that script yet, but. Um, so in that sense, that could be built into our model right now, and we just wouldn't, I just don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but yes, um, your follow-up, uh, Richard's follow-up here is, there are a lot of mechanically sensitive membrane protein channels. And so this is, um, right. So it is known, okay, so mechanically sensitive 
membrane protein channels. Again, if you're watching and you don't know what that means, um, basically, so I've talked about these ion channels, they're in the membrane, right? And we've said that they can open and close um, maybe based on the voltage uh, on the membrane potential of the cell that they're sticking in. That might be one reason that they open or close. But there's also known to be some ion channels which will open and close based on basically how the membrane is bent or stretched or moved. So they're sensitive to mechanical um, stimulation. Um, and in fact, um, you know the the you know the receptors that are in on your skin, right? For example, have this kind of a ion channel. This is how you feel things in the world, is because when you physically press something, your the tip of your finger has receptors that when they're moving, they actually create a little uh, electrical charge and they stimulate a neuron, and so that's how your brain can sense it. And these are also in. Uh, neurons that are in the worm, and there's evidence that, that they're in fact even in the motor neurons of the worm, which means that as the worm bends, the neurons know or have the potential to have the information of basically how they're bent and where they're bent um, in time. And so one of the major models of how the worm crawls is based on this, this mechanism of feedback, um, which goes from a motor neuron, which is both stimulating a muscle, but it's also going to be stimulated by how that muscle causes the whole body to bend. Um, and it may be either more activated or more inhibited on the basis of that. And there's sort of a, a circuit that's been drawn out that will would actually explain how crawling is possible with just essentially this mechanism of um, mechanical feedback. So, um, okay. So it looks like it's fine. Just check the connectome, and there are actually three gap junctions between two inhibitory motor neurons and body wall muscles, between DD1 and VD2 to BWML8 and D. Okay, cool. And are those the, I'm interested if those are the only three gap junctions that are known between motor neurons and body wall muscles? Um, like the only three in the entire animal? If so, that's an interesting, yeah. So, okay. So three out of thousands, I guess. I don't feel too bad for not knowing that off the top of my head. Um, although it kind of raises the question of like, really only three? You know, if you have more than zero, you'd imagine that uh, it would make sense to have um, more. But uh, hmm. but you know, that there's many things in that. Maybe the data are incomplete in some way. Um, but um, okay, so that's neat. So let's 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 assume that probably only three gap junctions isn't going to be a huge feedback response. Um, in general, but this other thing about how the ion channels can actually um, be mechanically sensitive it probably matters more. So, um, okay, and then um, Istvan also asked in here, um, there's the same question for neurotransmitter released postsynaptic potential function. I would guess the ligand dependent uh, gating is a bit similar to enzyme kinetics. Uh, here's the same question for neurotransmitter potential synaptic function. I guess the lag independent gating is a bit similar to enzyme connects. Um, okay, I'm not sure with the first part of your question. The second part with lag independent gating, um, so to explain what that is, so a ligand is any kind of a, um, any, well, it's, it's not strictly just a protein, but um, it's basically any molecule which can connect to a receptor and have an effect. Um, so often, um, there's another word called neuropeptide, which uh, refers to a special kind of ligand which affects neurons, um, which can basically float between the cells attached to a neuron and then change the membrane potential of the neuron. And, and this is known to also occur in the worm, and it's also known to occur in our brains. Um, and it's very troublesome for folks in computational neuroscience to think that in addition to having to worry about all of these chemical synapses, which I described, and the gap junction connections, that they also have to worry about the effect of arbitrary molecules floating in the nervous system that can have an effect on stimulating specific neurons or not. But, um, but those do exist. And this is um, a bleeding edge area of research right now. Um, in fact, um, Folks are working on papers right now to define the extrasynaptic connectome or the connection graph between the neurons that is would be responsible for things other than uh, classical synapses or gap junctions. 
um, to basically work out how cells can influence each other at a distance, just by essentially producing a special molecule and releasing it and diffusing it, and essentially through diffusion and, and um, Brownian motion, um, a neuron that's not connected at all to another neuron could potentially uh, activate it. Um, so um, for the purposes of open worm, and also to answer the question for Richard, if we're doing that. So um, we don't currently have in our simulations anything about the extra snap to connect them, anything about, um, well, we actually have data on the peptides and the peptide receptors. We don't yet simulate the peptides and the peptide receptors because we're going to need to use a whole different kind of algorithm to simulate diffusion. Um, so we're leaving that out of kind of version zero of, of the model. Um, we want to just capture the classical um, connect them in the classical gap junction. But our whole approach to doing the modeling um, is going to let us layer the extrasynaptic connectome on top of that. Um, and then also, we're not currently, we don't currently have a place for the mechanically sensitive membrane proteins yet. Um, but we will uh, have a good place for that um, because we're going to know about the bending of the worm from the cybernetic uh, simulation. And so the cybernetic simulation is going to send both sensory input into our model if you touch it, um, because it's going to be based on the sensory neurons, and it's also going to send input in on the bending. So we'll be able to read out the bending state from the cybernetic body model, and, and we'll be able to plug that into these motor neurons, and we'll basically be able to tweak up and down their membrane potential um, as if there were those ion channels in there that were responding to the bending. Um, I don't know. Now, we're going to probably have to make a lot of assumptions about um, what the exactly how much impact they have. Um, but there are some papers that have already done that and made some good guesses as to what they are. Um, so we'll be in good company and we'll have good, uh, we'll have good, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have good, uh, you know, evidence to draw from and uh, places to begin. Okay. Um, so yeah, really good questions, guys, by the way. Um, I'm, you're uh, making me work to uh, try to keep this at a level that's sort of both more or less accessible and also then like uh, answering your really specialized questions, which are great. Um, and, okay, so um, let me um, go to just one other um, one other level of uh, this on my side. So I guess um, I paused to answer questions um, when I was switching screens, and let's see. I think, I think this is the screen. This is our main badge list page. And yes, yeah, so now I'm logged in. So I can show you under the Muscle Model Explorer. I think I can show you. No, oh, no, it wasn't here. Hmm. Okay, hang on. Um, Let's, let's try this. OK, this looks more like it. Um, if I go to, this content. yes, OK, good. Um, Here's what the figures will look like. So other folks that have earned this badge um, will submit screenshots that look like this. Um, so you can kind of see what your answer should look like. Basically, what you'll do is you'll generate a figure. And this is what's going to come out of the code. Sorry. This is uh, the founder of the, the founder of badge list. Uh, we're giving him feedback. This is good. Um, okay, but um, so you'll so the code generates this, and um, what we'll ask you to do is just to find the figure that this is most closely approximating to. So on the left, this is our simulation, and um, this is the figure that it's trying to match. Um, or actually, I think it's this one. Yeah, yeah, this one, this one. So um, you can see good, pretty good fits, and this is what the original. So in bottom two figures of themselves simulations, and the top two are actual data. So our code that we produced 
their model should it should be a pretty exact match to this which is a pretty close match to the actual data so you get a sense of what it means for us to do this cell modeling so that it's pretty detailed um, and that it's uh, reproducing actual uh, data um, so that'll be yeah you, you, that's what the other one looks like as well I probably don't need to walk through that piece okay so um, the last bit um, to close out this uh, closes out is I want to walk you through um, what's inside of C302. Um, so just taking a quick step back. Um, so we explained that we're doing modeling of the cell membrane. We explained that the cell membrane is composed of ion channels. We've explained that we do that modeling then by taking a mathematical description of the way the ion channels work and the membrane work in the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. Then we said we can model specific cells like this, um, and we've looked specifically at a muscle cell, and there's some code which explains how that works. And now we're gonna take exactly the same approach and we're gonna apply it to <clears throat> the whole neural network and uh, of the C elegans. Um, and that is captured in a different repository uh, that we have up on GitHub. So, and uh, there's not yet a badge for this, um, but uh, it's our goal to create one soon. Um, that you'll be able to earn that'll do a walkthrough. But um, bef before that's ready, um, you've got me right now um, to explain to you a little bit about uh, how it works. So hopefully you caught the flash talk um, where Porg walked through this diagram. But the long and the short of it is that um, the C302 is a framework for generating many different versions of the C. elegans network so that you could study single synapses or whole subsystems or, or the entire nervous system, and you can do it at different levels of complexity. So I mentioned integrate and fire cells as being something that we use in the project but isn't the most detailed. So you could generate a network that only uses integrate and fire cells, or you could generate one that has the full, you know, full-blown dynamics. It also runs more slowly on your computer if you do it this way, but it's, it's, it's going to be more accurate. And this lets us have a data-driven approach to um, modeling the circuit where every piece of information that we add to the project um, will make a, a constantly iterating and evolving and improving um, neuronal network model. Um, and, um, oh yeah, so what's in there, actually before I show you this too, so what's in the model today? Um, our database for, um, for all of the biological details of the, of, um, of the C302 is called PyOpenWorm. That's a different repository that you can check out. And um, all our data sources are listed um, on this page, which is in our documentation for PyOpenWorm. So <clears throat> we've got the names of neurons, the types of neurons, their descriptions. Um, we've got the lineage names of all the neurons. Um, we've got the neurotransmitters, the neuropeptides, which I mentioned, and then inexins, which is the fancy word for the gap junctions. Um, that's what we know about neurons for muscle cells. Similarly, we've got names, cell descriptions, lineage names, and then we've got the neurons that um, are connected to each muscle. And then we've got the, the connectome or the connection graph between all the neurons, so the gap junctions and the synapses. And, and so those are the things that are in there right now. And this also like sources them. And by the way, you are also able to look at like the raw data itself and you're even able to look at the code, which will pull that data out and and uh, you know put it into our database so that you read out. So um, that is um, okay. So this is data that comes into the model, um, and so um, C three hundred two basically works um, in the following way. Um, there is a um, a single Python script which is built on a sort of a hierarchy of other libraries um, that uh, will let you simulate just the model that you're interested in. So this is an example looking at if you wanted to simulate all 302 neurons, you'd use c302full.py. And c302full.py, by the way, is in this GitHub repository, which is under C. elegans Python script c302. Um, <clears throat> it's down here, uh, c302full, this one. So it's pretty short. Um, I don't have time to explain uh, all of the code lines, but what I do want you to see in this diagram is 
uh, just I'll just kind of walk you through the pieces and parts of it. So C302 full, it's a specific file which uses C302.py. C302.py is um, uh, basically a bunch of C elegant specific um, methods written in Python that are going to use, they're going to make little objects that um, are going to define the C elegance network and then let you generate uh, different specific versions of that as you like. This is based on something else. It's called NeuroML, which is a whole other topic um, that is very important to the project, um, but I don't have time to get into right now. Um, but um, suffice to say that this is the thing which knows how to basically create the output of <clears throat> c302full.py, which is um, in a format that's known as libneuroml. And this thing is based on another library which knows how to write XML files, and XML files are a specialized way to encode um, any kind of data. And in this case, we're using it to encode a model of a nervous system. The other thing that uh, goes into C302 uh, full is um, uh, a parameters file. So parameters underscore, and here I've said star. And the star refers to the uh, kind of model that you want to use. So the star could be A, B, C, or D, as listed in this uh, axis over here, if you want. Or it could be other things that you make up. But basically, those parameters are going to are going to be the numerical values for things like how strong is the synapse, how much ion channel am I using, um, different numerical values that are like uh, parameters that you have to set in order to make the uh, model work. So, <clears throat> so it uses both of these. C three two uses both of these. And if you want to make your own version of the network, you would basically um, copy C302 uh, full, copy the parameters file, and you'd make your own versions of them, and you'd do some experiment. Um, by making changes to both of those, um, you could modify most of the things about the thing that comes out. The other thing that you would modify if you really wanted to change things like the connection graph is that you could modify the raw data um, of the connections, which um, are either coming from a spreadsheet or which are coming from PyOpenWorm, this data source that I um, this data source here that I was showing you. So you would have to actually modify like the biological um, knowledge in order for some of this to uh, change. But those are the three inputs to this. Um, and then what they produce are um, a couple of files. So one is the NeuroML file, this full.nml, and the other one is something called lemc 302 um, full.xml. One of these defines the math, one of these defines how the simulation is going to run, and you'll need to run a second program, which is called PyNML, in order to actually do the math. So um, that's important to understand is that in this framework, you have to run one piece of code just to generate the model to your specification, <clears throat> and then you run a second piece of code in order to produce the simulation output, which will then give you graphs, which will show you basically you know, the neurons operating over time. And if you do that, um, you'll produce um, figures which look like this. So in here, there's a summary of a bunch of different runs of C302 using different parameters. And I'll just show one that I think is interesting. <clears throat> so if you click in here, oh wait, that's just muscles. Um, so the, again, the, the rows in here are different levels of um, detail. And then the columns are like different kinds of models. So let's look at the full um, at the highest level of detail. And so this one has uh, 302 rows. <clears throat> and you're plotting in, in the uh, columns basically a color value which re relates to the membrane potential of one of the neurons. And there's a heat map graph here showing you what those values are. This uh, is in millivolts. Uh, I guess it's not labeled, but yeah, this is in millivolts. Um, and so you can see, and unfortunately, the um, <clears throat> the names of the neurons are in, in this particular axis are rather occluded, so it's hard to see, but they are in alphabetical order. Um, and anyway, you get a general sense of the kind of activity um, that went into this particular run of the network. Now, um, this network is not at all biologically tuned. So while it is able to, while it does have a lot of the data, which I which I just mentioned, in it, it also lacks a lot of other data, <clears throat> um, which we're assembling in the project right now. Um, so um, we can't yet make any biological claims about how this activity relates.
relates to what the real worm's neurons are doing in, in high detail, but <clears throat> to a low to um, a low approximation, to a very coarse approximation, um, you know, this is at least producing some interesting output, even if we know that it's uh, not yet accurate and not yet constrained by a lot of tests. <clears throat> so we'll be working on that. Now, if you were to look at this picture, not as a raster with colors, but if you look at it as a series of lines, um, what you get was this. Um, and this maybe just kind of looks like artwork, I don't know. Um, but this is like 302 lines that are all overlaid on top of each other, showing you um, the different activities of the cell. So this is basically the same picture, but just a different way of visualizing the same thing. And every different line has its own color, and <clears throat> this here shows a color key of that. So you should be able to generate this yourself, um, although um, um, depending on how you run it, it may take a really long time. Um, well, there may be some additional configuration hurdles to jump through. So that's why we want to make a badge that's going to walk through, walk people through how this works, and um, so they can generate themselves. But the code should be there um, to make that work. You should be able to basically any of these pictures you should be able to get out um, uh, yourself, um, so that anybody is able to you know run this simulation. Okay, so. Um, and that's using the same math, by the way. Um, at the at the end of the day, this is the same like Hodgkin-Huxley math that I talked about from the beginning, same system of equations. But now, uh, instead of uh, doing it for single cells, we're doing it for <clears throat> hundreds of cells. And so we have to use code that can take into account the fact that we're doing hundreds of cells and that we're basically running hundreds and hundreds of equations all at the same time. And so the code is a bit more complicated than what we can write out in like a single Python file in that one tutorial. Um, so that's where NeuroML comes in, is to kind of bridge that gap. Um, and if you want to know more detail about NeuroML and that whole family of things, it's a bit of a course in and of itself, but um, it's uh, very valuable and it's very helpful for what, everything we're doing. Okay, so, um, so Isvan asks, how do you decide whether a synapse is excitatory or inhibitory? I thought this data is not completely known yet. Oh, you're right. The data is not completely known. Um, and so I'm going to answer that in two ways. The first is that um, it's important to understand that the approach that we're taking to the simulation is iterative. So we can, I mean, <laughs> we cannot uh, build more into the model um, and be sure that it's correct until it's been measured. But we also know that it may be a long time before 100% of things are measured <clears throat> in the model. And we know that even when things get measured, they're not right, always right. So um, consequently, we um, we do the best with the data that is published. We um, form collaborations to generate new data where we can. And we try not to get roadblocked by any absence of data. And so we will make good, we will make um, careful assumptions